Coming up on Theater Talk... Judy Prince, my wife, said, why don't you do a show about kids? And I thought, you know a play you used to just love was Merrily We Roll Along? And so he suggested to me, and I knew the play and thought it was a swell idea. Theater Talk is made possible in part by the CUNY TV Foundation. This show, if I never do anything again in the rest of my life, I will have had this moment. From New York City, this is Theater Talk. I'm Susan Haskins. Michael Riedel is on the road, and I am delighted to be joined by my substitute co-host, Jesse Green, drama critic of New York Magazine. Hi, Susan. We're here today to talk about the terrific new documentary, The Best Worst Thing That Ever Could Have Happened. What we'll learn that? why that title is relevant from our guests. And it is a film by Lonnie Price, director, actor, and former star of Merrily We Roll Along, yeah. which is the basis of this film. Yes. And we are also joined by Abigail Pogrebin, who is an eminent writer and when she was a young actress was in Merrily We Roll Along and That's is an right. important presence in Lonnie's film. She sure is. Thank you. So, Lonnie, let's just get an overview mm. uh, ab about the film. Uh, Merrily We Roll Along was a musical that both of you were in uh, that opened on Broadway in 1981. Correct, yep. And what happened to that show, Lonnie? <laughs> well, uh, it opened in 1981 and closed very soon after it opened in, in 1981. Yes, yes. Uh, it ran. Uh, it ran two weeks, but we had an awful lot of previews, and it was um, a show that has uh, been done a lot since then and is a great success. But its initial outing was fraught with trouble, and um, I just the authors hadn't solved it yet. They think they have now. It was the um, final collaboration of Hal Prince and Stephen Sondheim, having done Company Follies, A Little Night Music, Pacific Overtures, Candide, and then Sweeney Todd. And then we were the musical following that masterpiece, Sweeney Todd. And so the expectations were incredibly high for it. The customers that we can get. You know, it was, it was problematic, and uh, well, they worked a lot Let's briefly it. discuss what the problems were. It's based loosely on a well, concept from a play by Kaufman Hart. It's by a Kaufman Hart play of the same title from 1934, and uh, it goes backwards in time, and it's essentially about uh, three friends and uh, the choices they make in life and how that affects their friendship, and uh, about idealism and what happens over a period of time to it. And uh, for me, it was always about sort of dreams and the price you pay to hold on to them and the price you pay to give them up. And so that is what your film is now about. Yes, yeah, the film mirrors hopefully the spirit it certainly and the does. themes it certainly does. Of, the, uh, of the original well, uh, show. But we need to establish to, to make sense of that that, well, how old were you when you were in the show? Right, I, how old were you, Abby? Uh, Abby was... 16. And I was 22. <laughs> right. And so. we play 40. We play in our 40s at the beginning of the show. And as it goes back, as it goes backwards in time, by the last scene, we're all pretty much playing our own ages. So that's the gimmick. Excuse me for that's, calling that. Yeah, that's and the convention. As old people, <laughs> and then you're stripped down that's right. to your real ages of right. idealistic... Wonder. Wonder youth. And, the, and how Prince and Steve's initial idea, which I still think is so thrilling, is, is that if kids played it, you would get back to that first moment in their lives, the last scene in the play, and you would think, oh, those actors won't make the mistakes of the characters they were playing. So that it had this meta idea on top of it that maybe this generation would not make the mistakes of their parents, and um, you know they kind of there was I think a line that, that we could do anything, we could change the world, and we're we're on a rooftop watching Sputnik. So the optimism and the idealism of what it is to be 18 and think your whole life is in front of you. And of course, what's tragic or moving or complex is, is that we've seen a show that knows, we now know what happened to those people and uh, they were very far from changing the world. They, they had a lot of personal problems and uh, idealism dashed and uh, selling out and you know, all kinds of things happened. But uh, you don't know, the wonderful thing about being young is is that you have no idea what's coming. We had Jennifer Holliday on uh -huh. recently, yes. and she talked about being in Dreamgirls, which beginning when she was 19, and she right. won the Tony. Then she, she talked about how 
it really messed her up. And oh. that was a hit. Oh, God. That was well, a hit. We, but were, the, yeah. we were rehearsing. Yeah. We were, we were rehearsing the with the Dreamgirls yeah. cast in the at same rehearsal studios really, really. at 890 Studios, Lower Broadway. And we had all of these gorgeous, leggy dancers coming through the elevators and with us, but assumed in our sort of cocky way that, you know, they were in their little show and we were going to be, we were going to be the all success story. All those poor story. guys in Dreamgirls. Yeah. And well, they, of course, know. went on to great, great acclaim. Well, before we get to what happened to everyone in the show, which is part of the content yes, of, indeed, the, of the sure. documentary. Let's look at before the fall, before, before things went south. Yeah. Um, one of the amazing moments in the documentary that no one has ever seen unless they were in that situation, which you both were, was receiving the news mm. that you were going to be in the cast yeah. of this Sondheim Prince show. Right. Um, it's a, an incredibly exciting moment. Uh, not even tempered by what we know later happened. It's yes. just too exciting. What was it like to be in that moment in real life? And, and when you watch it on screen, does it, do you have the same feelings? It was like if a kid wanted to be an astronaut and NASA calls you and says, you're going to go to the moon. It's like, that's kind of, it's, it, it's indescribable what being in a show by Stephen Sondheim and George Firth, directed by Hal Prince, meant to me and Abby, and I think and we, almost, all of us, so many of us, were Sondheim aficionados, obsessed with every lyric, could, you know, sing every show for anyone. Steve Sondheim, Hal Prince, who else could have been in that room? Christ and Moses. Or, <laughs> I mean. Suddenly, this was happening in front of you, but over a very intensive uh, testing time. So there had been auditions, you know, for a while, but this was a very intense last day and people kept getting cut, kept getting cut, kept saying goodbye, goodbye. And we were kind of looking around like, we're still here. We're still here. So, you know, the tension was rising. The exhaustion was profound and, you know, we're, we're kids and, you know, but to, to your point, Jesse, it was like an out of body experience at that moment when they said, the good news is that, uh, is that you're all in the show. You guys are it. You are the select few. Did any part of either of you feel, or did anyone around you feel, and I'm particularly thinking of parents, because you were only 15, as you just said, think, this is weird. This is, this is not normal. 15-year-olds don't get cast in big Broadway shows like this. This is, this is dangerous. Did, was there any clue that there was any problem that could come from this? You have to assume that the people who were auditioning for it, their parents were already on board with them being performers yeah. because uh, I don't think they would have been able to, right. you know, go up for it. I mean, you know, my parents um, did, I'm the only Jewish guy that didn't want to, they didn't want me to be a doctor or a lawyer. They <laughs> wanted me to be an actor, which will tell you a little bit of something about them. But um, so I think all of us had that kind of support. Yeah, but I would just say my parents actually, when my sister and I have a twin sister, and we got cast in Annie when mm. it was... Um, Annie the Musical, when we were 10, they, we actually auditioned together, which was a mistake, but we did everything together. And my parents actually did not want us to do that. And, and for probably the reasons you're intimating of, this is gonna derail your educational life, this is gonna derail your social life, it's very hard to come back if you go off on a professional path. And they, even though we, we came close to that, they actually steered us away. I feel like in a weird way this was there. Okay, now you still want it, you're 15, we're gonna be okay this time. And I would also just say Hal Prince was very paternal yes. through this whole process and that had a big effect. It was like we were his kids. One of his kids, Daisy, who was my classmate, was, was in this last day of auditions, extremely talented. Um, and it felt a little bit more like family, even though we, don't, we didn't know him so well. Well, and I found a letter in Hal's uh, papers at uh, the public library, I don't know if I ever shared it to you, from your mom. Oh my gosh. After we yes. closed saying thank you for taking care of my daughter and for being so kind and for being so loving. I mean, you, I mean as, as tough as that time was for Hal and Steve, they never showed it to us. They never made us feel like we weren't good enough. They were always Uncle Hal and Uncle Steve. I mean, they always treated us with great respect and love and care. Even and after kindness. Frank Rich called us dead wood. <laughs> <laughs> they were well, still loving. And you have him in the movie saying... Here was my chance to write about these heroes of mine, and I knew the show would fail. It was a painful piece to write. Have you forgiven him? I have forgiven him, yes, I do, because I obviously <laughs> respect him. But I also think, I mean, it's a little unfair in the sense that, you know, 
it's it's this show. I mean, Lonnie's you know trying to get a sense of it's it sort of exploded since the failure. Yes, yeah. And this film is getting at that too. That something can have a second wind, a second, third, fourth life. Well, the, you know? the film is complicated though because while it's chronicling that, mm -hmm. at the same time, after the closing of the original Broadway production. Yes. It's also chron chronicling what happened to all of the young people who had been in yes. it. And those trajectories are not always the same. No. The, the musical, as you pointed out, got rewritten a number of times. Yes. And Sondheim told us at a recent screening of the film that he now considers it to be a finished work. Yes. Uh, and uh, it is definitely much improved structurally and, and in other mm -hmm. ways. Um, although without the kids, it never quite, to me, has the same punch at the end that mm. you described. I did watch the audition process in your film and I was thinking, uh oh, there's going to be trouble for some yeah, of those yeah, people. Yeah. You landed on your feet and, and, and actually then you got to a point where you said, no, um, um, being an actor is, is too hard, too precarious, hard. And, precarious, and, precarious, and I have yeah. other talents and you became a, a very well-known writer. Thank you. But there were people who seemed to have been messed up to some extent by that experience, although they probably would have been messed up by other experiences, but they were messed up by that. I think that we've all been influenced by it, and, yeah. uh, but I, I, I think nobody in that cast would have traded right. that experience. The other thing is that, you know, what Stephen Sondheim said was how guilty he felt. It was, though he had had shows that closed quickly, he never had shows that had kids in them, and that he actually felt badly about disappointing the kids. Yeah, he that, said that he felt that uh, he had pushed unfledged birds out the window or he, he yeah, had some yeah. imagery like that and and even well, started that to was cry. A, and Hal has always felt like this mm. this is we I let the kids down in fact I, I don't know if you know this Abby but he came to my dressing room a couple of nights before we closed or maybe the night we closed and uh, he said um, I'm sorry I didn't give you a hit he <gasps> said I wanted to I think I gave you a good show but I didn't give you a hit that moment for me was so I mean uh, he, that he felt so badly yeah. for me, yeah. and I think we were all feeling badly, you know, for ourselves, but also for them. I mean, it was a, it was a, it was a really difficult time for them, but that they were concerned always about us. And even at the end, to do that, I was, I was so moved because I felt like saying, I, it, "This is the greatest gift anyone's ever given me." Now, the, but the title of the film is the best worst thing. Yeah. That ever, so w we know what some of the best is. Yeah. So now let's talk a little bit about some of the worst. So for you personally, for you personally, and I, mean, I would just the say it was it was very disillusioning to see your heroes stumble. And I wouldn't say fail because I don't feel like it was whole wholesale mm -hmm. failure, but to see them struggle and not solve a problem in front of your eyes because they were really till the last oh, minute so hard. changing scripts, costumes, songs, you know, major uh, major things were being thrown in, and you kind of began to have a sense of. Wow, this is this is something I've never seen before. I thought when I was a fan of these giants that it all worked out in the end. And you still kind of thought that it was going to. And when they gathered us and said, we're closing, mm. it was like, my God, well, who's coming to save the day here? And where are the angels? And there were no angels and it was over. And it was over fast and completely mm. after so much run up. And viciously. And kind of say. viciously. And there was a lot of schadenfreude. So I guess for me, that's a formative experience at 16 because the idealism, it's not that you still have, you don't still have dreams, but they're tempered by a really harsh reality that you've lived through. Um, and I was going back to school. I just went back to class, which is a very different kind of fall or, or cushion. For some people who are going back to their careers, I thought, my God, the resilience that's required now to start again, to start over. You mean some of the ones who stayed in performing? In, like yeah. Well, at Walton that point, or, everybody. Or well, we there all were a lot stayed of professionals in, by then. Nobody Young. had changed paths, uh, you know, the day after we closed. But, but everybody soon enough, to, a number of some you. Did. Yeah, yes. Little by little, people trickled away and did things that they found more rewarding eventually. Your leading man was fired. Yes, and replaced. the, original, the yeah. original lead uh, was replaced James Weisenbach. Now, was yes. that a clue to you that things were going, how far before the opening Ooh, did that I think happen? we knew we were very far. I mean, you know, from the, from the first preview, it was very clear that there were, there, the People were walking out. <laughs> <laughs> That's sort of a clue. Well, but also, you know, I was standing off stage for this, they had a first, the first scene's a big party scene, and it has a, yeah. a lot of jokes in it. Yeah. We, and Not nothing. Really. And I was standing backstage going, oh, something is wrong. Uh -huh. Something is not quite right here. 
Um, but they, and interestingly enough with the film, you know, they wanted it to be about a, a, a society of people that went backwards in time. And so each one of the people in the show had characters that went back in time that you traced. And, you know, the other sort of sad thing about the company, they weren't hired as a chorus. They weren't great dancers and singers. That wasn't their gift. They actually were character actors. Mm -hmm. But as Hal and Steve went, whoa, too many people to focus on. We're making it about these three people, oh. or these five people. So my They're part in the chorus. whittled away to nothing. You had originally been I was, I was his wife. wife and yeah. I still and you, feel and very connected. You remained his wife, but I remained his wife, but barely. Nobody did. But, and James Weisenbeck very graciously appears in your film. That was the day before I was fired. He's an important part of it. Well, let's yeah. talk about, let's, let's move to the making of the film yes, now. Please. When did you decide that you wanted to work on this material in some way, and well, uh, what was the, it supposed to be originally? There's, there's two things. When I, when I turned 50, you know, you start kind of thinking about... You're 50? Ah, not anymore. Um, when I turned 50, I started thinking, you know, how did I get here from there? You know, you start looking at your life going, what were the choices, which was very reflective of the show itself, and that's actually a lyric in the show. And then we did this reunion concert in 2002, and I was singing Old Friends, a wonderful Sondheim song, to Jimmy Walton, who's my old friend. And it occurred to me, I was no longer singing my character's life, I was singing my own life. Uh -huh. And that the songs had started to be about who we were as people, not as characters. And so I thought, wouldn't that be interesting to um, reflect the show in the lives of the people that were in it? Being that it went backwards in time, now we were on the other end of the 15 to 40. Um, what would that, it's sort of mirrors on mirrors, sort of a Pirandello right. kind of experience, which is what the reunion concert was. And um, I was aware that we, there was this footage, uh, and I thought, oh, if I could only get that footage. But I made Let's the movie talk without Talk about it. what the footage you were aware of was. In 1981, ABC, um, there was an ABC local show, you may remember it, you guys may remember it, called Close Up on ABC. It was like a magazine show, and they had probably three segments. And they were doing uh, a segment on the making of a Broadway show and how smart Sweeney Todd just happened. Let's go to Stephen Hal. They said yes, and so they started filming. And then after the auditions... Uh, they filmed meetings with Helen Steve, which are in the film, which are extraordinary, oh. and auditions and all kinds of stuff. And me in my bedroom at my parents' house talking about my dreams for the theater. I mean, amazing things. Then they discovered that ABC Corporation had an investment in the musical. And in those days, that's a conflict of interest. Yes, well, today, there was today would be no totally problem. fine. Yeah. Yeah. Synergy up? today. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. No, then they, they had some scruples then. They said, we can't do this. So they pulled it. And, um, and then they actually found out that they had to have paid SAG minimum to everybody and they'd never had that money. And so they basically said, uh, it doesn't exist and further we burned it. And so everyone said that it was gone. And I, th there's something odd. I had this prescient thing. I just thought, it's not gone. I don't believe they burned uh, that film. And, and yet you went ahead with the movie not expecting to. Not having that. it. Yeah, okay. Not having it. So but, you were making the movie. Yes. Um, and then I got, actually, we hired a man named John Miller Monzon, who is somebody who searches for film, oh. you know, for archival film. And he said to me at our meeting, well, I think you have a 9% chance of finding this. <laughs> Not even 10, a 9% <laughs> chance. I thought, that didn't sound so good. But um, anyway, we, I said, I think it's there. So they went into all the databases again at ABC and all kinds of places, and they had typed in, Merrily and Hal and Steve and uh, Alvin Theater, uh, nothing, nothing, nothing. And they went back one more time and they typed in B Way, <gasps> B apostrophe W. 37 boxes of film popped wow. up on the screen. They had been sitting in a mountain in Connecticut, just mag and, 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 and negative, undeveloped, uh, for 35 years. And I kind of, I mean, this is woo woo, but I kind of thought they were waiting for me. You know, they were just sitting there. And uh, they got them in and. Uh, they uh, and, and said, I think we have them. I think we found you them. You show us you opening the box. Yes. So and wonderful. that's real. That's it's not a treasure. strange. Now, There's the Holy Grail. Yeah, that was, yeah, it's wonderful. Yeah. Now, before we went on to time, I, I want to ask you, you mentioned that this was the last collaboration at that during that golden period mm. of Sondheim and Prince. Sadly, yeah. I mean, and it was the last collaboration, was it not, because this did not go well. Well, I don't think this, that helped. What was the conflict? You know, I think one of the things mm -hmm. that he talks about in the show, Steve, was, was the schadenfreude. People were so... In the film, he talks were about it. In the film, he talks about that people were gunning for them. They'd had so much success. They'd had such a long run. It was almost like, you guys, you can't have it all. And so there was already a lot of kind of, you know, the bad press was almost for no reason. It was, it was kind of wishing them failure. I think that had a strain. And I would just say also that... Um, 
the fact that we all were so emotionally, it was a very rare intimacy. There's always an intimacy with the cast. There was something different here, and I think it had to do with our youth, which yeah. was they were sort of tending to this kind of fragile group. And I, I think it just was almost like, oh, we got to do something. We got to take a well, break. Steve says in the film, I think very eloquently, they were mavericks who were successful. It's okay to be hacks and make a lot of money. That's okay. And it's okay to be mavericks and to live in a garret. They were mavericks who were successful and, I would say wealthy, but they were doing very well and that everybody hated them for it. But and not so to be they, ghoulish, but did you observe them clashing? Never. Never. Uh. Never. They were so poker-faced about, I mean, I don't know what was going on between them and between, and by the way, we should mention George Firth, yes. the great book yeah. writer who wrote Company with them. And we never saw any tension, but that was, they protected us from everything. And can you imagine, I mean, no, no out of town, a brand new show, at that time and everything went out of town, in the fishbowl being the biggest stars of the theater and it not working. And all their friends and all the intelligentsia going, oh, did you see the new Sondheim Prince show? And they never in any way made us feel like we were in a flop, ever. And all I kept saying was, you know, I remember going out of the stage door once and someone says, yeah, the first act's good, the second act still stinks. And people were sort of sh about it. And um, I just said, they're fixing it. It never occurred to me that it wouldn't be fixed to the degree that it would be fine. They were Stephen Howe. Of course they're going to fix it. We're just working. But you, but you talked about the experience of, you know, when James Wiesenbach was in the lead and you said the jokes aren't working. Yeah. After he left. And, After he and, left and Jimmy Walton came in, yeah. who was terrific and did, he had skills that James Wiesenbach right. did not right. have. Jimmy is a, is a singer and a dancer as well as an actor. Yes. And James was an actor. And, and, and also one has but to listen to Not a Day Goes By. Did he, you know how good him, Jim is. Yeah. But, but did you after that have this sense of, being on stage in a performance and going, whoa, this is not... It got better and better, Susan. Uh -huh. And they would stop walking out by the end. And by the last few previews, they were standing, they were cheering, and we, and I believe Hal and Steve thought, it's okay now. Oh, really? We did it. We did it. Whew. And I think they were, I think they were blindsided by the uh, right. reaction. <laughs> and you should see the, the picture of the hug, of their hug yeah. after the reunion concert because it, in a weird way it was closure after and, and so. they did work together again yes they yeah. did they did gold or a bounce or bounce, bounce, one of the yeah, when, of when the everybody was out gunning for them again, again i'm afraid somehow. yeah, yeah I, I think it's um i think how steve was right about them being that successful and in in all ways that was uh short in front of, you know i think people were like okay you've had enough of this so and also we were so vulnerable no star the show did not look good we were kids. The other thing I just also want to say about Hal and James Weisenbach is Hal wanted something raw. He was charmed by the rawness of the kids. He had seen a production at Dalton of, of, of Oliver that Daisy was in. And the curtain came down. And when the curtain came up before the bow, the kids were standing up and jumping up and down. And then they went, oh, now we have to bow. And he found that charming. And he thought, wouldn't that be interesting to do on Broadway? But a Broadway audience did not find it charming. It just, it just didn't we, we kind were of jumping take. up and down, though. And then you have this wonderful footage of you all coming together. Yeah. It does just touch everyone about the joy of show business, even if for the people who, because you have your one star, we have to quickly mention. That's right, Jason Alexander. Your one Alexander, star, absolutely. Jason Alexander, and, and, and that's a whole interesting we're and you could argue, I mean, on Tanya Pinkins and Liz Calloway and right. Jane Carlo Esposito. We had to focus it on the five people, on, on, on a few people, which was, was sad to me. But it, it, nonetheless, it's the only way to do it. But so I kind of learned the lesson they learned 35 years later uh, while making the film. But right. it, it sounds like each of you changed your professions. You, uh, uh, yeah. 15 degrees, now a, a director. Yes. And you, uh, 180, 180 degrees, yeah. uh, or maybe a little bit less. Yes. Um, and Lonnie, and, you, you are directing a very important production coming up. Yes, yes, uh, Glenn Close and Sunset Boulevard. Yeah, that's pretty uh, great. That. Yes. Yeah, and, and Abby has a book coming has out. Has a new book. Yes, it's called My Jewish Year, 18 Holidays, One Wandering Jew. Oh, that's so great. <laughs> yes, I, I when? celebrated every holiday in the Jewish calendar, and it's, there's, let me just tell you, Oi, quite a few. There's a lot of them. So no, it's that's a full-time job. You didn't when does do the book come job, out? Did you? <laughs> I did it. I know it. Oh, for God's sake. When does it come out? March. March 6th. Perfect. But it sounds like all things told, you would go with the best part of the title, not the worst. That's a good part point. Yeah, no, but I mean, the disappointment of the, cl I mean, you know, you have to say the disappointment of the closing was devastating. Yeah. I mean, you know, the, the, Abby explains it so beautifully in the movie, the crash. You know, we were sailing along and it wasn't just like, oh, it might be, oh, it was like, bang. 
And then to close in two weeks, then we did the album, as you know, the yes. day after oh. we closed. So Saturday night, and that last performance was... Tears. I mean, people, the, our, time our time is just... We're all on the scaffolding. Just, literally, there's no sound coming out. We're just <laughs> crying through the entire thing. It's, uh, and then we got up and for 16 hours did the album, which, and I think the album is why the show Absolutely. has lived. The worst was is that it didn't run because we wanted to do it more. Um, and we were no longer together. It was and over. We were no longer together. But, you know, Abby, when you're saying you know, that you learn to maybe not risk as much from it. I mean, you could say that's the worst, or is that the best lesson of all? Because you've it's, done... I think it's both. Both. It's, it's complicated. Because you did a great job. Ah, well, thank you. Yes, that is the, the best, best thing, is your film. Lonnie oh, Price. thank you. And thank you, Abigail. Thank you Pope for having me. me. Thank you yeah, so much. We're and so, so this film here. is running all over the country. You can easily, you will, you will find it. And then after that, some big cable company will pick it up, and they'll show it, and then you'll be able to buy it. And, and then All they'll the turn things. it into a musical. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Lonnie Price, thank you so thank much. You, Jesse, so much. Thank Abigail Pogreven. Thank you. And Jesse, thank you so much. Thank you, Susan. I've never been happier rehearsing actors. I've never gone home sure that a show was going to be a success. I thought, this is just it. I just didn't feel for these characters. Quonks, lurches, and on several occasions, faints dead away. I've never seen rows of people leave. It was like we are flying and then suddenly we crash. What just happened here? Our thanks to the Friends of Theatre Talk for their significant contribution to this production. Theatre Talk is made possible in part by the Frederick Bowe Foundation, the Corey and Bob Dinelli Charitable Fund, the Noel Coward Foundation, Carrie J. Fries, the Dorothy Strelson Foundation, and the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs. We welcome your questions or comments for Theatre Talk. Thank you.